And he said, Paul, you remember that time that you called us all together 90 days after you came to Christopher Newport and you laid out that audacious dream that Christopher Newport would become a great university? He said, I got to tell you, he said, I was sitting there that day with the faculty. We were all together and we heard you and we walked out together and we looked at each other and we said, that guy is crazy as hell. <laughs> but you know what? Great dreams have power and consequence. And we have been blessed with extraordinary success. Because of you, and because of a lot of wonderful people, amazing things have happened on this campus. There is not a school in America that has come so far so quickly. Our applications have exploded. The quality of our students has soared. We've added hundreds and hundreds of full-time faculty drawn from the greatest universities in the world. We've completed over a billion dollars of capital construction and created a breathtakingly beautiful campus with world-class facilities. Our reach and our reputation is spreading across this land we become a school of choice for high ability students and they love this school and they bring our campus alive with their energy and their enthusiasm and their intellect. So as we start this 55th academic year, we have so much to celebrate. It was at commencement in May that we last assembled as a university community joined by over 10,000 people on our beautiful great lawn in front of that magnificent Christopher Newport Hall. We awarded over 1,100 diplomas. Rector White and I shook every hand, Rosemary hugged every graduate, and the bell and the clock tower rang for three hours. It was a great and glorious day. My hugger in chief is here today. Rosemary, thank you for being at my side as you always are. She's in an uncharacteristic position because she is someone who gets up in the morning and sprints through every day. About two weeks ago, she had a total knee replacement. This is the first time in my life that I've been able to keep up with her. <laughs> but in a few weeks, she'll be uh, running after her grandchildren and uh, keeping up with our students. Thank you for loving and supporting and encouraging me for 45 years. Today we welcome back our faculty, but many of our colleagues have worked throughout the summer to prepare for this day. Lawns have been watered, lawns have been mowed, beautiful flowers planted, buildings painted and cleaned, residence halls made ready. This important work has been accomplished and I want our colleagues in plant operations, grounds, and housing support to stand so we can say thank you with a round of applause. So come on, stand up. I also want to recognize our many colleagues who over this summer, when so many of us were absent, 
welcomed thousands of prospective students and their families, conducted interviews, made four setting sale events, two leadership adventure programs, and registration goes smoothly and successfully. I ask all of our colleagues in admission, the registrar's office, financial aid, the business office, the president's leadership program, student life, dining services, residence life, all of you to stand, an extraordinary group of colleagues. Please stand so we can say thank you. So let's talk about admission in this new class. This week we welcome our first year students and I'm happy to report once again it's an outstanding class of young women and men. Our freshman class will number 1,225 students, once again exceeding our annual goal of 1,200 students. They come from 20 states and six foreign countries, and 21% are students of color. With an average high school GPA of 3.8, this is academically the strongest class to enter Christopher Newport University. The SAT middle 50% range is 1070 to 1240. The GPA middle 50% range is 3.5 to 4.0. That means that 25% of the class has a high school GPA above 4.0 and an SAT above 1240. Nearly 400 freshmen will participate in the President's Leadership Program. On average, they've earned a 4.0 high school GPA and an SAT score of 1200. 122 freshmen will participate in our honors program. 100 of those students will participate in both honors and leadership. These students on average have earned a high school GPA of 4.3 and an SAT of nearly 1,300. Remarkably, 406 freshmen, that's a third of our first year class, will participate in either PLP and or honors. More and more, we want the profile of our entire class to reflect leadership and honors. So we must all work hard to ensure that the intellectual life of this place is rich and rigorous and rewarding. What accounts for this enrollment success? the best qualified freshman class in our history. Well, certainly our rich, reach and reputation are spreading, but it also results from a lot of hard work. My thanks to all the members of our faculty and staff who so generously contribute their time and talent, supporting admission open houses, PLP and honors events, admitted freshman days, and the many faculty who welcome prospective students to their classes. Our thanks to Dean Rob Lang and Christina Russell, and to all the members of our admission and financial aid offices for an extraordinary job well done. We strongly encourage prospective students to visit our beautiful campus for an interview. Nearly 3,000 students were interviewed over the past year. 970 of those students have enrolled. That means almost 80% of the class of 2020 came to campus and were interviewed. Those interviews are extraordinarily important. This all important work of interviewing students is masterfully performed by our university fellows and by our mission staff. 
A special word of thanks also to Dr. Lori Underwood and Dr. Jay Paul for their work with incoming honors students, Brian Larson and the PLP staff with prospective leadership students, and Bonnie Tracy and her colleagues in the registrar's office for enrolling several hundred well-qualified transfer students. Next, let me talk about enrollment and student success. So important. In preparing our new freshmen for a strong academic start, the Registrar's Office designed class schedules for all of our new students in 72 learning communities, processed credit for nearly 3,700 high school dual enrollment or AP courses, while also working with housing to accommodate roommate requests, which are so important to enhance our students' learning community experience. The Office of the Registrar also programmed more than 100,000 degree evaluations and 100,000 individual course registrations, recorded nearly 106,000 grades, and graduated 1,275 students. So my thanks to Juliana Waite and the Registrar's staff for all they've accomplished. I think that deserves a round of applause. And any time you want to break in with applause, please feel free to do so. I also want to applaud Libby Wesley and the Career Center. This past year, the center engaged nearly 4,000 students and more than 1,000 employers and hosted nearly 350 of those organizations on our campus. On September 27th and 28th, the Career Center will host a two-day career and graduate school event, and we expect more than 700 of our students will participate. We know that Christopher Newport's rigorous academic programs and our emphasis on leadership and honor and civic engagement empower our students for success in the workplace and graduate school. I'm pleased to report that our research indicates that within six months of graduation, 85% of our students are employed full-time or enrolled full-time in graduate school. This is 12 percentage points higher than other universities in our Carnegie classification. And when we add those students who work part-time and those who attend graduate school part-time, this number exceeds 90%. That's an extraordinary result. Now, discussing extraordinary results, listen to this. Over many years, the university has undertaken significant efforts, as we know, because we've all been involved to enhance student success with special emphasis on improving our retention and graduation rates. This year, we celebrate a six-year graduation rate of 75%. That's 12 percentage points higher than just five years ago, and 24 percentage points higher than 10 years ago. Amazing. And then listen to this. Our freshman and sophomore retention rate has increased by 10 percentage points over the past 10 years. We won't know our exact retention rate until classes begin next week, but we do know that nearly 89% are now registered. We are assuredly advancing toward our goal of 90%. That is absolutely <laughs> remarkable. Those numbers are absolutely astounding. Schools across this nation are awed 
by what you've accomplished. But the most important thing is we are empowering the lives of the young people who are coming to this campus. And each one of us is making that difference in the way that we embrace these young people, the way we invest in their lives, the way that we go the extra mile to be there for them. So thank you. I want to applaud the celebration of our sophomores as they declare their major field of study at signing day. There's so many pieces to this student success initiative that reaches across our campus. Signing day is a piece of that. It's one of our signature student success initiatives. This past spring, over 92% of our second year students participated in this collaborative event where every academic department warmly welcomes students to their major. I'm immensely grateful to our faculty, to Pete Carlson, Janine Ledger, our Center for Academic Success, the Career Center, the Registrar's Office, all of you for your hard work and the support of this important new tradition and to all of you. Many of you are aware, I think, that all of these initiatives and all of our success have received recognition now across this country. University Business Magazine honored Christopher Newport as a model of excellence for implementing innovative, effective, and interdepartmental programs to bolster student success. In addition, Noel Levitz awarded Christopher Newport the Gold Retention Excellence Award for 2016 for the most successful student success and retention programs in America. Christopher Newport was recognized at the Noel Levitz National Conference attended by over 1,600 representatives from more than 700 colleges and universities. Dr. Lisa Duncan Raines, as the leader and champion of our student success efforts, was in Dallas to represent us, and I want Lisa to stand so we can applaud her enormous contributions. My thanks also to our provost, Dave Dowdy, to the members of the Student Success Coordinating Committee, and to all of our faculty, and to all of our staff for supporting and encouraging the success of our students. Every one of us is involved in this, in caring about these young people, and supporting them, and encouraging them, and being there for them every step of the way. I thank you. Next, I want to talk about student life. And as I move toward a discussion of student life, I want to underscore the important work of the University Council on Diversity and Inclusion. Work to enhance our recruitment and retention of underrepresented students, faculty, and staff, and to promote and enrich a campus culture of respect and civility. It is important that our students, indeed all of us, live and work and study and learn on a campus that reflects the faces of 21st century Virginia, America, and the world. Moreover, we want to ensure that all people feel welcomed, honored, and fully engaged in the life of this academic community. And that must be and will be an important priority for us as we move forward. At Christopher Newport, we actively and intentionally recruit engaged students. This is not a place for spectators. I make that very clear, and Rob Lang makes that very clear, and his colleagues, as we recruit students. 
We send spectators to those big schools where there'll be a number on a computer, where it doesn't matter whether they go to class or not. At Christopher Newport, we expect our students to go to class, be prepared, and be engaged. And we expect them to get involved beyond the classroom as well. To be involved actively in the life of this place. And they are. We want them to bring this campus alive with their energy and their enthusiasm and their intellect. We have more than 200 clubs and organizations, an extraordinary number for a school our size. And last year, our students participated in nearly 18,000 events, totaling 17,000 hours of activities. I know most of you go home in the afternoon. You should be here between midnight and 3 a.m. <laughs> the culture of service remains strong as well on this campus. There is an expectation of service on this campus. Two campus-wide events, day one of service and our Food for Thought campaign will soon celebrate their ninth year our Bonner Service Scholars and Ferguson Fellows continue to lead and serve by example. And more than 100 students participated in service trips over spring break. Our PLP students contributed over 35,000 hours of service this past academic year. 35,000 hours in one academic year. Our Greek students offered another 15,000 hours of service. And our student athletes continue to serve in large numbers within the community. Our Greek community continues to grow as well. More than 1,400 students in fraternities and sororities, nearly 28% of our undergraduate student population. This week, three sororities, Phi Mu, Alpha Phi, Alpha Sigma Alpha, and one fraternity, Sigma, will be the first to move into our new Greek houses. The opportunities to lead and serve are many, but the success of student life depends on all of us. I want to applaud the work of Dean Kevin Hughes, Katie Welbrock, Brian Larson, Bill Ritchie, Ada Bagley, Melissa Scott, the entire student life staff as well as the dining and housing staff, led by Bob Midget, Bob Olson, Kevin Ososki, and of course, Drew Kernett. Thank you all so very much. In a very real way, this campus really never sleeps. And these folks have to stay awake. <laughs> and I thank you. I'm pleased to announce that Kevin Hughes has become Vice President for Student Affairs. In addition to his current duties, he will assume the responsibilities for University Police. Join me in congratulating Kevin Hughes. Kevin, we're most grateful for your leadership and your many contributions to the success of this place. Let me say a word about Chief Andy Eggerman. Andy has been with us for three years, but will bring his time at CNU to a close on September the 1st. This is Andy's third retirement from state service. <laughs> he retired first from state police, then from the Virginia Port Authority. But we're very grateful he answered our call, stepped out of retirement to join us. He quickly adapted to life in the academy, and we've benefited immensely from his years of experience. Chief, we thank you for your many contributions over these three years, and we are immensely grateful for your 41 years of dedicated service to this commonwealth 
And I'd like you to stand so we can express our appreciation. I'm pleased to announce that Captain Scott Austin has agreed to serve as acting chief as we launch a search to fill this important position. Andy and Scott, we're grateful for all that you and your colleagues do each and every day to keep us secure. Keep up the good work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Next, let me speak to athletics. The young women and men who compete at Christopher Newport continue to embody the true meaning of the term student-athlete. 199 of our student-athletes earned academic honors last year. They are not only great competitors on the fields and courts, but also determined students in the classroom. And they successfully balance the rigors of academic life with the demands of practice, travel, and competitive play. My thanks to all of our coaches and athletic staff, Joyce Ann Kubarolis and her team, for your extraordinary work. Again this past year, the captains of Christopher Newport were the winningest intercollegiate athletic program in Virginia. Our student athletes won 75%. Listen to this. This is really extraordinary. Our student athletes won 75% of their contests, nearly 10 percentage points ahead of every other school in Virginia. Amazing. Most memorably, our basketball teams made the Freeman Center come alive during the winter as they put together remarkable seasons. Bill Broderick's women advanced to the Sweet 16 round of the NCAA tournament for the third time in four years. John Krikorian's men advanced to the final four. In all, CNU won eight conference championships and nine of our teams played in the NCAA's postseason tournaments. The overall success of our programs brought the highly competitive Capital Athletic Conference All Sports Award back to our campus for the second time in three years. My thanks to Kerry Gardner and Kyle McMullen for their leadership of the department over the last academic year. And after completing a national search that saw over 150 applicants, Kyle McMullen was selected as our new Director of Athletics and we wish him well. This past week, our football coach, Matt Kelsner, announced that this will be his last year of coaching. Matt Kelsner is Christopher Newport football and always will be. This will be Matt Kelsner's 15th year as our head coach. Coach Kelsner has led us to over 100 victories, and I know this year there'll be many more victories to celebrate. Matt Kelsner and senior football, though, have done much more than win games. Senior football has contributed immensely to the life and energy and spirit of this young and vibrant university, and for that we will be forever grateful. Happily, Matt will serve as Associate Director of Athletics after this football season. I hope Matt is here. Are you here, Matt? Yeah. <laughs> Matt Kelsner, thank you for all that you've contributed, and thank you for all that you'll contribute in the days ahead. Stand up.
he's the humblest football coach I've ever seen. Uh, go captains. Thank you, Matt. Next, I want to talk about two subjects that have to be talked about. Title IX and threat assessment. Before we move to academics, let me talk about these two important matters. Last June, our Board of Visitors adopted an important policy. It is a revised prohibition of sexual violence and sexual misconduct and other types of discrimination. It is a single comprehensive policy that applies to all students, faculty, and staff. There are a few matters more serious than sexual violence. Violations of this policy will not be tolerated. This policy is published in our handbooks and on website. Training will be provided to everyone and everyone. Every student and every member of the faculty and staff is required to participate. If you're a new member of the university community, you'll be required to attend training provided by Michelle Moody, our Title IX officer. If you received training last year, you'll be required to complete training that will be offered online this year. Now last year, some people did not respond promptly to training. I want you to hear me very clearly. Michelle Moody schedules a number of training sessions. You are to find one of those and you are to be there or you will find yourself somewhere else. If you become aware of information concerning sexual misconduct or other discrimination, you must share that information with Michelle Moody or one of her deputies. And they are Matt Kelly, Katie Welbrock, Lori Westfall, or Carrie Gardner. And then let me speak to threat assessment. It's also true that we live in a crazy world that is increasingly challenged by violence and threats of violence. If you observe violent behavior on our campus or behavior believed to be an imminent threat, you should and must report it immediately to our police department. If you have concerns about an individual's behavior that may be a safety issue, but not an imminent threat, Please contact someone in our police department, the HR department, the office of Title IX, or the provost office. Each of these offices have been trained to respond to these situations, and they can immediately convene the threat assessment team, if necessary, to determine what appropriate action should be taken to keep our community safe. The Code of Virginia requires that that team include the Chief of Police, the Director of the Counseling Center, the Dean of Students, the Director of Human Resources, and the University Council. We've added the Director of Title IX and an Academic Dean, so we have a broader perspective. Let's take care of each other. Please, when in doubt, always report. Now let me move on to academic life, a much happier topic. This year we'll have 276 full-time faculty. Yes! Now that's an increase of just one position over last year, which is an astoundingly modest increase 
for Christopher Newport University. But it's a big change in the composition of our faculty. And Jana, we should celebrate that, shouldn't we? Last year, 65% of our faculty were in tenured track or tenured positions. This year, that percentage is 70%. Think about that. Yes, break in with applause. In one year, we've closed halfway to our long-term goal of reaching 75% tenured or tenure-track faculty. I, too, applaud the good work of the faculty search committees, our deans, the provost, and the dedicated work of Shannon Overby and Lori Westfall for accomplishing this amazing feat. Our 20 new faculty have impressive credentials and demonstrate a passion for teaching and a love of learning. Two are members of Phi Beta Kappa, bringing the total number of Phi Beta Kappa faculty to 26. We welcome all of our new faculty at Christopher Newport and look forward to your important contributions as we pursue preeminence in the liberal arts and sciences. I now ask all of our new faculty to please stand. New faculty, please. by your presence and welcome you warmly to this community. As we increase the size of our faculty, we're also focusing on reducing class size so our students derive the immense benefits accruing from close interaction with our faculty and with fellow students. This fall, approximately 59% of our classes will have 19 students or less, and only 3% of our classes will have 50 students or more. I'm grateful to the chairs, the deans, and the registrar for a job well done. Let me underscore that that is a core value of Christopher Newport. At the very core, that defines who we are. That contributes immensely to the quality of the academic experience. But it also distinguishes us from all the other schools with which we compete. It is incredibly important as we go out and tell our story and compete for these high ability students that we're able to assure them that if they come to Christopher Newport University, they're gonna be in a small class taught by a gifted professor who's going to know their name and engage them and challenge them and demand their very best each and every day. That's why driving down the size of our classes is so important. And that will continue to be a priority for us going forward for those reasons. Last year, we separated the Luter School of Business from the College of Social Science and asked Dr. George Ebbs to take the helm of the Luter School. Under his leadership, this has been another good year. For the second year in a row, Luter graduates scored above the 97th percentile in the business major field test, the top 3% in the nation. That's extraordinary. And this June, Bloomberg Business Week named the Luter School one of the 100 best undergraduate business schools in America. Well done. Two years ago, the State Council on Higher Education approved CNU's Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering degree. This year, for the second year in a row, over 40 incoming freshmen have indicated they want to study either computer engineering or electrical engineering. Also this year, for the first time, over 30% of our graduates were STEM majors. And based on enrollments, we see that percentage continuing to grow. In truth, we become the go-to school to study STEM in Virginia. 
if you don't want to study with 15, 20, or 25,000 other students. This is the place. Also in the sciences this year, we had our first ever Goldwater winner, applied physics major Brooke Bird. A student athlete, I would point out, a tennis player who spent the summer doing research at Harvard this summer. As you may know, the Goldwater Scholarship is considered the most prestigious scholarship for students in the natural sciences and engineering. And we're proud of Brooke and her faculty mentors for her outstanding achievement. In the College of Social Sciences, the Department of Government launched its minor in human rights and conflict resolution. And the Department of Leadership in American Studies rolled out its newly revised leadership minor. The college also has three academic centers, the Center for American Studies, the Wassum Center for Public Policy, and the Reef Center. And I'm happy to report that together these three centers have raised more than a half a million dollars in grants and gifts. This past March, the College of Arts and Humanities hosted its first conference on the global status of women and girls with 70 attendees from around the world. Planning is already underway for this year's conference, which promises to become an annual event. This summer, Christopher Newport hosted the high school students for the Summer Humanities Institute. I'm very grateful to Dean Lori Underwood for her vision and for her leadership. And just this spring, the Public History Center, in its second year, received a grant from the National Park Service and the Mariners Museum. Congratulations to Sherry Shuck Hall, the center's director. While faculty and curriculum are critical components of the university experience, special programs such as honors, study abroad, undergraduate research, and opportunities for service and service learning broaden and enhance the academic experience. And we have some very strong programs in those areas. This year, in addition to 22 presidential scholars who now receive a $10,000 scholarship and are both honors and leadership students, an additional 22 honor students receive our new $7,500 honor scholarship. So with 122 entering students, our honors program is flourishing and our commitment to competitive scholarships will certainly ensure the academic level and performance of our honors cohort. Our study abroad program is gaining momentum. This past year, 358 students studied abroad on 17 short-term programs led by our faculty and full semesters at universities in Europe and in Asia. This number has increased from just 197 five years ago. 26% of our graduates have now studied abroad, and our goal is to raise that to over 30%. I want to thank our faculty, the director of our study abroad program, Mandy Pierce, and Vice President, Vice Provost, kid, not president, for making more of these enriching opportunities available. Also, last summer, we held our inaugural CNU Summer Scholars Program. 26 students joined our faculty to work collaboratively on faculty research. And nine of those students have already produced externally presented products of scholarship. This year, the number of summer scholars has jumped, jumped to 35. My thanks to Vice Provost Klein and Dr. Jeff Carney for their leadership of this emerging signature program. As you know, at Christopher Newport, we endeavor to form good citizens and leaders. Our Center for Community Engagement now enters its sixth year of partnership with the nationally respected Bonner Foundation. Our 34 Bonner scholars will contribute over 10,000 hours of meaningful service in our local community this year. 
The center also oversees the Service Distinction Program. Service Distinction recognizes all students who, over at least two years, performs a minimum of 140 hours of service. This year, there were 140 students that graduated with Service Distinction, and 1,200 students are now enrolled in that program. In all, the students tracked by the center performed over 57,000 hours this past year. My thanks to Brad Brewer and Dr. Stephanie Bardwell for their leadership and their commitment to service. We changed the world. Yes, 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 yes. My hope is that we can help these young people understand while they're here that the future of this world is not going to be shaped by great nation states or powerful parliaments or mighty armies, as important as those institutions are. But rather, the future of this world is going to be shaped by people just like us who will have the courage to engage. The future of this world is going to be shaped by people who are willing to reach out. We change the world one person at a time. And it begins with us in this moment by responding to the reality that's right before our face. And that's the lesson that these young people are learning. And that may be the most important and powerful lesson that they'll learn on this campus. And that's why our emphasis on service, and that's why this Center for Community Engagement, and that's why this whole notion of service learning is so important. To make these young people aware of the world that surrounds them, to give them some notion of their responsibility for others, to encourage them to reach beyond themselves. And in that process came some appreciation for their ability to make a difference, to be empowered by that, to have their own life enriched and transformed and in the process, empower and transform the world. <clears throat> Finally, I want to say a few words about SACS accreditation. This past year, we've been very busy on two fronts. First, our own self-study, the Compliance Certification Report, or CCR, is nearly complete and will be submitted to SACS by September 12th. With 93 standards to address and numerous evidence files to back up our claims, the full CCR report is indeed a monstrous tome, representing many hours of work by many of you. And I want to thank all of our staff and faculty who have participated in this monumental effort. Special thanks go to Vice Provost Klein and to Professor Rourke Mulligan, both of whom have read through and edited every single standard. <clears throat> While we were working on the CCR, we also selected the topic for our Quality Enhancement Plan, our QEP. As many of you know, it centers on undergraduate research literacy. Ably led by Dr. Michaela Meyer, the QEP committee is now finalizing its program for delivery and assessment of the plan. In January, we'll submit our final QEP to SACS. My thanks to Dr. Meyer and our other members of the QEP team. The next major step in this process is for us to host the on-site visiting team this coming March, March 21st. 22nd and 23rd. They'll be reviewing the standards, but their major focus will also be on the QEP. 
I trust that all of us will give the visiting team the assistance they require and, of course, a warm welcome. This SACS accreditation process is enormously important. It's enormously time-consuming. Thank God it only comes every 10 years. <laughs> this task has fallen principally into the capable hands of our Vice Provost, Jeffrey Klein, who has done an extraordinary job, and I want Jeff to stand so we can give him a rousing round of applause. Thank you. Finally, the quality of our academic leadership team is remarkable. If any have provost deans that work as hard and as accomplished as much. I want to acknowledge the leadership and excellence of our provost, Dr. David Dowdy, our deans, Bob Colvin, Nicole Guajardo, Lori Underwood, and George Ebbs, and our distinguished vice provost, Dr. Quentin Kidd, Jeffrey Klein, Lisa Duncan Raines, and I ask them all to stand. A marvelous team. to the faculty. I am most grateful to the ways that you instruct and inspire our students as teachers, as advisors, as mentors, in your classrooms, in your laboratories, and across our campus, and throughout the world. And I thank you for all that you do. You're precious. And you're the heart and soul of this place. And we thank you. It wouldn't be a report if we didn't talk about capital. A great university must instruct and inspire. Nothing does that more powerfully than magnificent art and architecture. That's why it's important that over the past 20 years, Christopher Newport has created a campus of civic proportions and beautiful design. Our vision and dedication and hard work in building a classic American campus is now being recognized across the country. This is the cover of traditional building magazine. This summer, our architect, Glave and Holmes of Richmond received the 2016 Palladio Award for National Excellence in Neoclassical Design for Christopher Newport Hall. That, and I quote the article, serves as the cornerstone of the university's two decades long transformation into a world class campus. Last year at this time, we had just moved into Christopher Newport Hall. 170 of our colleagues, representing 16 departments, moved in over the summer, anxiously awaiting the return of faculty and students. Since that time, the building has become a hub of activity, an appropriate backdrop for graduation, and the place where students go for assistance from admission to graduation. The glass floor has become absolutely iconic I enjoy seeing students who make the trek to the fourth floor to see and walk across the floor. It's wonderful to see them come up and they walk around the floor, <laughs> screwing up their courage to race across the floor. Usually I'll grab them by the arm and walk them across, assuring them that they can make that passage safely. Greek Village Phase 1 is nearing completion. The village consists of four chapter houses totaling 100 beds, and our students will move into these houses at the end of the week. 
Now, I don't believe the grass is actually there yet. <laughs> Amy actually put the grass in the picture. I just want you to know that before the students arrive this weekend, we will roll out the sod. We don't have the patience to wait for grass to grow at Christopher Newport. The sod will be rolled out. It will be green and grass, and it will be lovely. But I just wanted you to see, but that, those are the real pictures of the building. The, that's the picture of the building that was taken yesterday. We simply painted in the grass. <laughs> just for full disclosure. But they're not bad, are they? They're kind of pretty. of our students will move in this weekend and there will be green grass. Construction has also begun on the expansion of regattas. This project will add 300 additional seats for dining in a spectacular two-story pavilion and creates an entrance from the Great Lawn. The expansion of regattas will be completed by this time next year. The Alumni House is rapidly taking shape and will be completed by the end of this calendar year. This beautiful Georgian house will provide a variety of meeting and event spaces, will be home to the Office of Alumni Relations, and will graciously welcome alumni to our campus for years to come. Our next two capital projects are the expansion of the library and the creation of a fine arts center. The library has become an all-important gathering place for our students. We have this wonderful problem at Christopher Newport. The library has become the gathering place. The students had required that the library be open on most days 24 hours. It is filled with students from the crack of dawn to late at night. We don't have enough seats to accommodate our students. So that has required us to design the next phase of the library, which will increase student seating from 400 seats to 1,200 seats. None of your students will have an excuse not to find a seat in the library. So here's a picture of the next phase of the library, extending toward Warwick Boulevard. This is the face of the library if you were standing on Warwick Boulevard, looking toward the campus. It will add 800 additional seats to accommodate 1,200 students in all, and it will provide critically important space for our expanding collection. Our library holdings now exceed 784,000 and our six-year goal is to reach one million. The Mariner's Museum Library has moved back to the Mariner's Museum where it will remain. And this creates more space for stacks, reducing our dependence on high-density shelving. That means we will now actually see books in our library. I'd like to recognize the work of Mary Sullen and the entire library staff in preparing the library for this expansion project. They worked alongside the movers to box and move 50,000 volumes to Gosnell and moved 2,200,000 volumes to the south side of the library. Special recognition goes to Beth Young, who created the plan and led the staff through the project. During the construction, the library, yes, yes. Imagine moving 250,000 volumes. Thank you, Beth Young. Thank you, library staff. During the construction, the library book and journal collection will be available through a request system developed by the library. Additionally, we created the Tribble Library Study Annex in rooms 101 and 102 in the Freeman Center. 
Mary tells me this is a mere 225 steps from the library. <laughs> Mary and her staff will do everything they can to deliver excellent library services during the construction period. We are ready to begin construction and expect the state will issue bond funding in the next 30 to 60 days for this and for a number of projects that have been approved around the state. This project will take two years to complete. We're ready to go. Books are moved. Contractors ready to go. Get on it, Richmond. <laughs> the Fine Arts Center will face the Avenue of the Arts and stand next to the Ferguson Center. This is an early uh, image of what that Fine Arts Center might look like. Uh, but this shows you where it will be. The Arts Center will support the important activities of our Fine Art and Art History Department. The many programs of instruction to citizens of all ages provided by Christopher Newport and our partner, the Peninsula Fine Arts Center, and provide galleries and exhibition spaces for visiting and permanent collections. $49 million for the completion of design and construction has been authorized during the 2016 General Assembly session. I'm pleased that Courtney Gartner, the Executive Director of the Peninsula Fine Arts Center, has joined us today. Working with our friends at the PFAC, we will move forward now with the design and we'll get started in the next couple years on construction and make this uh, spectacular building a reality. So what we'll have is the performing arts in the Ferguson Center, the visual arts in this new fine arts center standing side by side, connected, so we have the marvelous flowing back and forth of programs and people with the, free, the Ferguson Center looking out toward Warwick Boulevard, the fine arts center looking toward the Avenue of the Arts, uh, a marvelous combination of the arts that will empower the life of this academic community and the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'm very grateful to Bill Brower for his inspired leadership and his talented and dedicated team that makes all this possible. Christine Ledford, Hunter Bristow, the architect's office. And let me mention Lynn Wood Gardner who retires this very week and has been a, a marvelous member of our team for all these years. Uh, Bill, thank you and all of your colleagues. Uh, Christine, thank you. Let me talk about the Ferguson Center briefly. As we celebrate our 12th season in the Ferguson Center for the Arts, over two million patrons from all over the world have come, been seated where you are seated to enjoy the finest in the performing arts. Our own students and faculty presentations as well as the finest performers in the world. This year under the expert leadership of our friend and colleague Bruce Bronstein, will present another remarkable roster of world-renowned artists. Once again, there'll be something for everyone. And although many of the performances have already been announced, let me share just a few of those names this morning. The 2016-17 Broadway series is outstanding. In October, the full throttle story of the struggles, fears, and triumphs of young artists navigating the world of dance, music, and theater. Fame, the musical. In November, the Pulitzer Prize and Tony Award-winning masterpiece, the 20th anniversary tour of Rent. In January, the ultimate feel-good musical that over 60 million people worldwide have fallen in love with, Mamma Mia. In January, the quintessential backstage musical comedy classic featuring some of the greatest songs ever written, 42nd Street. 
The Broadway series concludes in March with a coming of age disco fantasy Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, you are the first to know, listen to this, in October, the award-winning entertainer, luminary of television and movies, Broadway stage, more than 25 million records sold, Vanessa Williams. An unforgettable evening of entertainment on this very stage. In addition, of course, there'll be many, many other performances. Some of the world's finest artists, great symphony orchestras, jazz, rock and roll, ballet, modern dance, comedy, as is our tradition. Early this morning, nine seats in this concert hall were randomly selected. Under five of those seats, we have affixed a CNU logo. Don't you peek. <laughs> Under four, we have affixed the logo of the Peninsula Fine Arts Center. When you leave, check under the bottom of your seat. If there's a CNU logo or a PFAC logo, you are a winner. Hand that to Margaret Yancey and you'll receive either a gift certificate to the Freeman Center, to the Ferguson Center, worth $100, or a gift certificate for a family membership to the Peninsula Fine Arts Center. Now we're almost there, stick with me. You've been wonderful. There's just so much to celebrate. You know, as I move to the end of my remarks, I want to pause for just a minute. We have so much to celebrate. And we have so much that we aspire to accomplish. Many individuals and offices are recognized for their outstanding efforts. And many are mentioned. But there are also so many of us who quietly go about their work day in and day out, making this university hum so successfully. They're on the front lines with our students. They're engaging our valued friends and supporters. They're making us comply with all the state rules and regulations. They're setting up for events and taking down events. They're keeping us out of trouble. They're the ones that are helping us to move forward and do extraordinary things. So today I'd like to recognize a number of individuals and offices. I want to recognize and mention and thank all of the administrative staff and lab techs who support our academic departments and our administrative offices every day. Thank you very much. I want to thank Lori Westfall and the Office of Human Resources Happy birthday, Lori Westfall. I want to thank Andrew Crawford and the Information Technology Services. What a crew. Welcome back, Andrew. I want to mention a very special lady who's been an all-important part of this place for a long time. Donna Varner and Institutional Research. Thank you, Donna Varner. I want to thank Diane Reed in the business office. Extraordinary job every day. Thank you very, very much.
Jason Lyons in the Office of Assessment. Keep your eye on things. Thank you. <laughs> Faith Belote, our Director of Internal Audit. Keep an eye on things, Faith. Thank you. Another absolutely indispensable player here who makes an extraordinary contribution to our success, quietly, but importantly, Pat McDermott in the Office of Planning and Budget. And then there's Amy Dale and her team in Alumni Relations, University Events, Communications, and Public Relations. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs> Ryan Ferby and the Departments of Material Management, Warehouse, and Mailroom. We couldn't live without you. Thank you for all that you do. Every day, we depend so heavily on Bob Midget and auxiliary support, the entire staff. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Tammy Summer, Director of Emergency Management. Keep us safe and secure. There's a marvelous group of seven or 800 older citizens in this community that have embraced us, that come to our campus on a regular basis, that contribute to us in so many ways. They are led by an extraordinary woman, and I would want to recognize Jane Salzberger and her incredible team at Lifelong Learning Society. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then we have a group of foundations that empower our efforts every day. And there's this, they are led by a, an array of folks, Doug Hornsby, Spencer McDonald, Lamont Williams, and extraordinary staff at the CNU Foundations. I'd like to acknowledge their contributions. Now, I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege. Um, there are two people that are indispensable in my life, but that are absolutely indispensable to the success of everything that happens on this campus. Um, Cindy Perry is the chief of staff. She is the chief operating officer. She knows and is involved in everything that happens on this campus. There's no one that loves this place more. There's no one that contributes more profoundly to our success than Cindy Perry. She is an extraordinary woman and I love her dearly and I thank her for all that she does each and every day. And the other woman in my life, and I can say this this way because Rosemary's here, um, is uh, Beverly Muller. Um, uh, when we were offered the opportunity to come to Christopher Newport, uh, Rosemary said, well, I will come if Beverly will come with us. Uh, Beverly has been part of our life even before uh, we came uh, 20 years ago. 
Um, and uh, she is uh, an extraordinary human being. Uh, she has a total photographic memory, uh, literally, really. <laughs> and um, she um, has an extraordinary intellect and a, an immense heart and is deeply dedicated to, to the Tribbles um, and deeply dedicated to this university and to everyone here and works extraordinary hours um, because she is at my side. Um, and so there is... There are no two people that contribute more to what happens on this campus than Beverly Muller and Cindy Perry and Bill Brower along with them. And so I just wanted to single out um, uh, my principal co-conspirators and say thank you. A final piece of this speech. Five years ago, our Christopher Newport family embarked on our first ever comprehensive fundraising campaign. We set a goal of $42 million and established five priorities. Scholarships are our top priority. We must raise scholarships to reward merit and help our many students who have financial need. We are now a school of choice for these marvelous students. And no student should be forced to walk away simply because of money. Second priority is faculty excellence. We must establish endowed professorships and endowed funds to empower the success of our remarkable faculty. Third, Programs of excellence, from honors to lacrosse, from the Center for Community Engagement to this Ferguson Center. Across this campus, our colleges and academic departments, music and the arts, study abroad, every program that's part of Christopher Newport needs financial support to enhance the educational experience and to help us make a real difference in our community and the world. Fourth, the Alumni House. And that's the only capital project. It must be a beautiful place dedicated to all of our alumni across the decades. And it should serve always as a welcoming home. And finally, and all important to the future, of this young university, we must increase alumni giving and alumni support because the future of this university rests in the hands of our alums. We're very young, so we don't have a lot of alumni today. We don't have a lot of alumni in numbers, and the alumni that we have haven't been out there a long time. They haven't accrued a lot of wealth but the alumni that we have now, the students that grace this campus love this place. And they're high ability students. They will go out and they will do well. And in the future, they will remember this place generously. We need to inculcate in their hearts and minds the importance of giving back and giving forward and remembering their alma mater. And that's why the annual giving is so important. So as we march into the final year of this first ever campaign, let me tell you how we're doing. First with scholarships. Thus far, we've established 113 new annual and endowed scholarships, totaling more 
than $12 million. Our second priority, faculty excellence. We had no endowed professorships when we started, imagine. Now we have two. We're doing better. The Jennings Luter School of Business Endowed Professorship, established by Bruce and Lori Jennings, and the Torgler Professor of Music, established by Mary and George Torgler. Dean George Ebbs is the first Jennings professor, and Dr. Mark Reimer, our first Torgler professor. We must establish more endowed funds to appropriately recognize and reward our faculty, and we will. Alumni giving. When we started the campaign, just 8% of our alumni were giving. Last year, we reached 17%, and as of June 30th, we'd exceeded 19%. No other school in America has seen that kind of explosive growth in alumni giving year over year in only five years. None. Our goal for the campaign was 18%. We have blown by 18%. Extraordinary response from our alumni. Senior Day and our extraordinary senior class gift campaign are two reasons our alumni giving has grown so dramatically. Senior Day 2015 was our first senior day and surpassed everyone's expectations. For 2016, this infographic gives a great snapshot of our remarkable success. For the second year in a row, captains around the globe wore silver and blue, showcased senior flags of all kinds in all places and gave generously. I even understand that for several hours that afternoon, we were trending on Twitter. The senior class gift. Giving to support things we care most about in our lives is one of the most powerful, meaningful, and joyful things that we can do. Instilling that in our students while they're here ought to be an important part of the Christopher Newport experience. The incredible growth of the senior class gift campaign over the last five years is a testimony to the fact that our students get it. The class of 2014 made a gift of $76,000. The class of 2015 gave more than $83,000. This spring, the class of 2016 gave a gift of $106,000. Absolutely extraordinary. And it reflects the spirit of this place. But the most amazing thing to me is the faculty staff campaign. Our success begins with you. You know, we all work so hard. We ask so much of each of you. You give so much of yourself. We invest our minds and our hearts into this place into the students we serve. And then each year we ask you to make a financial contribution as well. And you do. Virtually every person on this campus. Because you love this place and you know how important it is that each of us pitch in. Two years ago, 83% of everyone contributed. Last year, 87% of everyone. This year, 92% of all faculty and staff made a gift to Christopher Newport. Wow. 
You are absolutely the magic of this place. And there isn't another school like this anywhere in this country. Thank you. Thank you. So as we sprint to the finish of our comprehensive campaign, just one more year, here's what we're going to do in this final year. We'll focus more than ever on new scholarship support. We'll establish additional endowed professorships. We will exceed $1 million in support for the Alumni House. We will complete it and we will open its doors. We will pursue transforming support for international study and undergraduate research opportunities for our students. We will surpass the 20% alumni participation landmark. And hear this, hear this. Much like Katie Ledecky and Michael Phipps, Phelps in the Olympics, much like Katie Ledecky and Michael Phelps in the Olympics, we will obliterate the $42 million campaign gold and raise more money than any of us ever imagined. And having made that audacious commitment, I think it's time for me to introduce Adelia Thompson and her team. Adelia Thompson has masterfully led our campaign, and we have an outstanding advancement team, and I want them to stand so we can express our thanks for their hard work and for the remarkable results that we have obtained thus far, and for all that we will do over the next year. Adelia Thompson and your remarkable team. And now I'm going to bring these remarks to a close with a story of two special gifts that were made this spring. The Lighthouse Fund was established two years ago as an emergency fund to help students in crisis. As you remember, students cannot apply for assistance. Recommendations for Lighthouse support can only come from faculty and staff. Now that process would not work in most places, but here it works because we're such a, a marvelous community. We really know each other. We really care about each other. We really go the extra mile for each other. You are our students' academic advisors, counselors, teachers, coaches, program leaders, department chairs. You're individuals who work throughout our campus where our students live. You hear their deeply personal stories. You are the ones who can help. To date, the Lighthouse Fund has provided very meaningful help to 21 students. And 20 of those students have been able to remain at Christopher Newport and continue their studies. At a meeting in May, Mary and George Torgler issued a challenge. They pledged $100,000 to the Lighthouse Endowment if the university was able to raise the total of $250,000 by the end of the campaign. Well, members of the senior class committee attended that meeting. And when they heard the Torgler's challenge, they immediately, immediately responded with a pledge of $78,000, pledging almost every dime of the money that their class had raised. And thanks in large measure to these two extraordinary commitments made within moments of each other, I'm pleased to report that as of last week, we have reached the $250,000 endowment goal. <laughs> and 
Now that's an extraordinary story. If you end it right there. But there's more. You see, our seniors made their gift with a stipulation. Their stipulation was that their lighthouse endowment fund monies would be set aside each year for you. to support faculty and staff in crisis. You see, that's what happens when you create a campus community that cares about minds and hearts. A community that instructs and inspires students to speak the truth to do what's right, to honor the humanity of every person, to care about others, to lead, to engage, to serve, to love. That's the spirit of this place. That's the magic of Christopher Newport. That's why I love this place. And that's why what you're in doing and what we're doing is so important. So thank you. Godspeed. Go, Captains.